I love speaking at IAN's conferences because so many of you get what I'm about to share with you today. You know, we can ask the questions, is there an afterlife? Are we eternal beings? Why are we here? I can guarantee you there is an afterlife, just like those who have had near-death experiences. I've had spiritually transformative experiences, but I'm going to share with you stories today from people who have gone all the way and are in the so-called afterlife right now. But as you will find out today, it's not over there. The afterlife is right here. I'm going to tell you how I know that. I want to introduce you to my friend Brenda Baker, very good friend of mine, passed to the other side a little over a year ago. And Brenda was studying with me to become a medium. I was her teacher. She studied with other teachers of mediumship, and we were very close. I knew that she would try to get through to me after she passed, but I had no idea it would happen one day after she passed. I was sitting in my RV that my husband and I are traveling around the country in now, when all of a sudden, Brenda dropped in on me. Now, there's one thing to connect with a loved one of somebody who I've never met before, but to have my friend Brenda just suddenly be so present one day after she passed, in her own voice with a sense of humor, telling me what it was like, the passing. I just blinked. I just woke up, she said. I'm right here, as you can see on the slide there. And I said to my husband, Ty, don't talk to me. Brenda's here. I say that all the time, poor thing. And I started typing what she was saying, taking down word for word her experiences of crossing the veil. She passed from a very aggressive form of cancer and knew she was going to pass. She said it was very easy and everything she was sharing with me, she wanted me to share with our friends. But I know that many people are skeptical and they want evidence that we're talking to somebody, not nice phrases like, it's beautiful here, I blinked, I just woke up. There's no proof in that. And I silently said to Brenda, there's not a bit of evidence in here that you're telling me. I need something. And suddenly she said, like my boa? I could see her flipping it back like this. And I typed it down, like my bow, and I typed my thought. What? Because it didn't make sense. But I intuitively knew that in that one short sentence, there would be incredible evidence that would leave no doubt this was Brenda. I was not just making up, oh, my friend who passed is here. So I typed up what she said and sent it to our mutual friend, Lynette, knowing Intuitively, Lynette would understand what the BOA reference was all about. So this was late. I went to bed, wake up at 2 in the morning, and had to know. I checked the email, and there's one from Lynette. And the opening line let me know we scored a home run. Three little letters that you all would recognize. O-M-G. <laughs> you see, Brenda and Lynette spent hours talking about what it was going to be like when Brenda passed. Brenda was going to come on my radio show later that month to talk about how one could face their death with such openness and, and being okay with it, because she knew what awaited her. But she was going to tell a certain story on the radio show. She didn't get to tell it because she passed too soon. But she would say to Lynette over and over again, tell me that story, Lynette. I love it. Tell it to me again. And I had never heard the story, and Brenda knew that. That's why she used it as evidence that this was her. So Lynette told the story in that email. It turns out when Lynette was a little girl, she was from Oklahoma, and her parents took her to New York City. She was so excited because they were going to get to see her favorite movie star, Zsa Zsa Gabor. So they're walking down Broadway, and there's this play with a big poster up front for Zsa Zsa being in the show. And Lynette was so disappointed because there's Zsa Zsa dressed like a farm girl. No makeup, nothing fancy. Where was her Zsa Zsa? And suddenly, around the corner, the stage door opened, true story, and out steps Zsa Zsa Gabor in all of her finest, <laughs> boa and all. And Lynette and Brenda, as they would discuss the afterlife, and she would tell that story, Lynette said, look, I know 
that this is what it's like when you cross to the other side. You could be a farm girl, or you could be an actress. You could be a mailman, you could be a trash man, you could be a teacher, a psychologist, it doesn't matter. You could wear blue jeans and t-shirts, or you could get to wear fun, fancy clothes. The bottom line is, these are just people suits, and I'm not talking about the clothes. And Lynette was convinced that when we cross through the veil, we shed the people suit and step fully into our magnificence. So here you are, you have just crossed the veil, you're coming through to your friend who is a medium and you know she will feel you and you hear, you sense her saying, I need just a little bit of evidence, Brenda. You have just a short bit of time to save energy and get your message across, your evidence. So you say, like my boa, can you imagine a more meaningful bit of evidence to say, yeah, I'm here, I just blinked, I just woke up and it's true. We're all magnificent underneath the people suits and outside. Our point here in this life is to bring that magnificence forward and let it shine onto everybody around us. So Brenda has done a lot of teaching since she passed. I'm gonna share some of her words with you throughout this talk today, but I loved what she said that very first day. Most people, Suzanne, are walking wounded. You can see the scars from up here. They're like little knife wounds all over the auras. They're battle scars, but that light never does go out. Just like you always say, we really are the light. And those of you who have crossed the veil in a near-death experience know that to be true. A common denominator of people who've had near-death experiences and spiritually transformative experiences know I am the light, and I teach that to people. I have felt that, I know that, but how to explain that to people? What do we mean, I am the light? It's something the soul already knows. So I was walking around one day through my neighborhood in Florida, trying to think about how to use a metaphor to explain I am the light. It was Christmas time, and our neighbor had one of these lights up. You've probably seen these where you shine red and green lights on a building. And I noticed he was, his was shining on trees. And where the branches were, you could see the light. But where there were no branches, the light went right through and you couldn't see anything. But clearly, the light was still there. And I had this huge aha moment. And my guides talked to me and gave me this beautiful way of teaching this. And I hope you'll bear with me. It gets a little bit cutesy and cheesy. But in the end, you'll see why I'm using the analogy that I'm going to use to help explain who we are in our full magnificence. Please don't use your left brain to try to follow me, follow me with your heart and it'll make sense. So a little thought experiment here. What if in the beginning all there is is light? But there's nothing at all to reflect upon, to reflect that light back. So it comes through as just darkness. All we're aware of is darkness. The light needs something to reflect upon. But that light is so full of potential and full of certain qualities like you see here, beauty, intelligence, creativity. And that light just has to burst forth and create, like any artist or composer or writer knows, when you're so full of that potential, it has to come out. So the light did burst forth with just a thought. I exist, just this awareness, because it is self-aware. And that little thought that was really nothing more than just an excitation of the field of pure light, knew that it was self-aware, and knew it existed. If you can't read that, it says, what a happy thought, I am. So I'm gonna call this our little happy thought bubble, as silly as that may sound. But see, because it's created by itself, has all the same attributes, it now wants to burst forth. It now wants to create, and so it does, and creates a carbon copy of itself. 
So we have two now little happy thought bubbles that have all the same qualities of the source, of its essence, but they are that same essence. They're not separate. They still know that. They become aware of each other and experience now for the first time this brand new feeling. It's so amazing to recognize themselves in each other. What are we going to call this? Let's call this feeling love when we recognize our source, our true nature in each other. And they recognize they're connected. They're not separate at all. And they say, this feels so good, it needs to be shared. What a happy thought this is. So they burst forth and burst forth. And soon we have all kinds of beautiful thoughts of the source out there, able to reflect the light. What are we going to call these things? Why, let's call them souls. And these souls created in the image of that from which they arose, these excitations in this field of pure consciousness, pure love, because everything is connected, go forth and create realities, worlds upon worlds, all created from consciousness, but all reflections of the light. So let's fast forward eons, and now the creations start to look a little bit familiar, correct? And they contain all the same qualities of the source of the field from which they arose. Self-awareness, intelligence, creativity, beauty, the desire to create more and more beautiful things, and evolve and continue creating. So how do we do that if we're different from each other on the surface, but we know we're all the same? Why, we have to each have a story that differentiates us, that allows us to grow by comparing ourselves with each other. Now, these original happy thought bubbles know that some of them are going to become so absorbed in the stories, they will forget who they are. That is the challenge. But thankfully, they'll always remain connected to the source because they can't be otherwise. So this is how it's gone throughout what we call time with this creation of stories. And I want to show you how a story might unfold. Let's take two happy thought bubbles with a story, and we're going to put names on them. The one on the left we'll call Ruthie, and the one on the right we're going to call Bill. Now, these two thought bubbles, Ruthie and Bill, when they saw each other, just like their very essence, they recognized something in each other. Even though they had never known love in their life, they recognized a feeling and they just decided to come into union and create something even more beautiful. So Ruthie and Bill got married and they produced from their thoughts another creation. And as above, so below, one little bubble, one little cell becomes more and more cells, and soon Ruthie and Bill created a little child. And that child was born, and of course she was self-aware and contained all the qualities of all thought bubbles everywhere. And Ruthie and Bill said, let's call her Suzanne. <laughs> and this little creation said, no, I am. Why are you going to put a label on me? But soon, Ruthie and Bill started teaching little Suzanne how to be in this world. And they told her she was a girl. And they told her, you please your parents, you're supposed to be a good little girl. And along the way, as little Suzanne grew up, there was something she felt she was supposed to remember, but she forgot. But she went on, and because she was always doing things by the book, and she liked to be very organized, and she had an older brother that was in the military, she went off and joined the military, very by the book. And because like attracts like, she was so attracted by this handsome naval officer that caught her eye. And they saw something in each other that couldn't be denied, and they became married, because that's how it works in this story. And this handsome naval officer, his name is Ty. He came with a family. He came with two daughters, one of which, named Susan, followed in her father's footsteps and joined the military. So Suzanne came to love her stepdaughter, Susan. Meanwhile, Suzanne's career was taking off, and she went on and became a commanding officer. She got to serve as the aide, the assistant, to the head of the entire United States military. She had his ear, but that didn't mean he always wanted to hear what she had to tell him. <laughs> but it was an idea. Idyllic story. 
in that career that she had chosen, she got to sit in on top secret hearings on Capitol Hill. She got to meet kings and queens, travel around on Air Force One, meet the presidents, many of them. It was such a good story. But as we all know, all stories go up and down. And this story went way down when Suzanne was in the last aircraft in airspace on a day that many will never forget. A day that many people who had forgotten completely who they are as souls hurt other people. Suzanne returned to her office building hours after it had been attacked and stared at that wreckage where her friends had been and had this thought, why? This life makes no sense because she had completely forgotten who she really was. It was a very dark time in the Suzanne story. Most stories have a dark time, but happily people come up from the story. Suzanne and Ty decided as a result of those experiences that life is too short not to live your dreams while you can. So they sold their house and cars, took off on their sailboat, sailed across the Atlantic Ocean with their little sailing wiener dog named Rudy, and life was once again idyllic. So the story went up, it went down, and it went back up again. But unfortunately, Suzanne hadn't learned the lessons her soul came here to learn, and that's part of the plan. And unfortunately, sometimes those lessons can be very painful. It was while they were sailing in Croatia that Suzanne and Ty got message they needed to call home, and they sailed an entire day until they'd found a telephone where they could call home only to hear the message that no one ever wants to hear, that the beloved stepdaughter, Ty's daughter Susan, the sergeant in the Marine Corps, had been struck by a bolt of lightning out of the blue as nature burst forth and took her home with her unborn child. Something in Suzanne, something inside bubbled up and she had to know if Susan was still here, something in her knew you couldn't kill the spirit, even though she had never had a belief in the afterlife. Something inside told her, if I'm going to connect with my Susan, I need to sit quietly and try to do it myself. And it was through that connection that Suzanne discovered a greater reality. It was through a medium that Suzanne discovered that Susan is still right here. She went on to write several books about this, and lo and behold, discovered through her sitting in the silence for so long that she could connect with loved ones as well. She was stunned, had never imagined during her naval career that she would one day talk to people who had died. Who would have thought they would have taken her security clearance away? <laughs> and soon she found herself sitting with other people whose loved ones had passed, bringing them the hope and comfort that that medium had brought to her and Ty and she knew she had found her calling, and she had to share the messages of hope with people to let them know we are the light. Do you remember? And then she met a team of spirits who said, you are one of us. All of you are part of us. You will call us Sanaya, and it is a most fitting name for us. For as Suzanne later found out, Sanaya means flash of lightning. And so she continued to sit in the silence, to grow closer and closer to her team in the spirit world, to connect daily with those who had passed until she could no longer die, deny, when I look beneath the surface instead of looking outward, I remember who we are. I remember what lies beyond the story, and this life is not all there is. And I remember what it's all about, that connection with each other, because we are all the same at another level. So the question is, that's a story. We're all telling stories, but do you remember? I know a lot of you here do. So we'll shift now out of the story to just sharing from one soul to another. Ultimately, there's only one soul, and that's what makes us so doggone magnificent. But I'm not talking about the magnificent that puffs off our egos. I'm not talking about the part of anybody here sitting here thinking, well, I don't feel very magnificent. I'm talking to the 
part of you that knows your innate beauty as the light. It's beyond the story. And this is where my friend Brenda comes in. Look at that face. Brenda spent most of her life hating herself due to interacting with family members who had completely forgotten who they were and put their stories onto Brenda. We met, not officially, when she came to a, a talk of mine called Heart Gifts, based on my book, Wolf's Message, at Unity of Phoenix in 2015. I didn't know Brenda, I didn't know she was in the audience. But as I shared the messages from this young man named Wolf, which I'm gonna share with you in a little bit here, something inside that hard exterior shell of my friend Brenda cracked wide open, and she felt something that she had not felt in decades. She didn't know how to deal with the emotions that were dug up, which called love. But she ran fleeing from that Unity Church and my talk. How do I deal with this? What is this? I don't know. So she went out on a limb and she emailed me, out on a limb because she thought, oh, she's an author. I've never emailed an author, but I have to tell her what I'm feeling. And we started corresponding by email because I answer everybody's email. And Brenda would write these long emails and I only had time enough to write a little email back. And then she'd write this big long email, just gushing her feelings. And I finally heard my guide say, we have a message for her. And I sat down and turned on my tape recorder and channeled Sanaya's message for Brenda. And it was so spot on. It just pinpointed where all of her emotional blockages came from, where it was showing up in her physical body, what she needed to do to overcome it. And part of it was to repeat the mantra, I am free. Free of the story, free of all of the ego's put downs. Well, she continued to write these long emails. And then meanwhile, I met this woman named Lynette, who is an amazing writer, and she started emailing me these long emails. And I said, I know what I'm gonna do. I hooked the two together. So they sent each other really long emails. <laughs> and every once in a while, I'd say, hey, you guys, thanks. And they would copy me, and I'd say, I I'll hear you. And they developed this soul-sister relationship like I have never seen. And something encouraged me to make a collage for these two. And I sent it to Brenda, and this is it. Surround yourself with those on the same mission as you, like a pack of lions. I took my old Navy picture, said, I've got your back, girls. There's Brenda's mantra, I am free. And down on the right is Brenda, who was tasked with weeding out the thoughts that didn't serve her, weeding out the lies her ego had told that her soul knew better than. And I'm telling you, that woman had an awakening like nobody had ever seen. She replied to almost every post I put on Facebook from my guide, Sanaya, with these beautiful messages and always, I'm free. She sounded like the biggest Pollyanna. But anybody that knew the happiness and the joy that was really coming from her couldn't help but smile. She became, that's Brenda on the left, Lynette on the right, self-proclaimed my number one stalkers, and they were. They came to every presentation I would give around the country. I love them to pieces. They founded a closed Facebook group now because they didn't want it to get too big, but they called it Souls Awakening, full of joyous people who remember who we are as beautiful souls. And so when I taught my second level of a mediumship class in Sedona last year, Brenda and several of the Souls Awakening group came to that class, but Brenda could only attend the first half of the first day. She was wheeled in with her oxygen tank because she, the cancer was pretty far along by that point. But here she is in this house that they rented the Souls Awakening group for that class. They called it the Heart House. Does this look like a woman who's about to pass in three days? Three days later, the, the cheerleader of everybody in that house, so full of joy, so full of love. She had really, really worked to weed out all of the false lies she told herself. She loathed herself when she looked in the mirror, but not when she passed. She knew who she was. She saw beyond the people suit. And that's what allowed her to wake up immediately when she passed. She had cleared out the gunk. She crossed the veil and she said it was just like waking up. Does that motivate you to do some work too? No sleepiness at all, communicating instantly with me from across the veil. 
So what was it about that talk, the heart gifts talk from Wolf, that burst her open? Well, this is Wolf, the young man who crossed to the other side the same way as my stepdaughter, struck by lightning. His story is told in my book, Wolf's Message. I'm going to shorten this because I have just a limited time today, but I will tell you why I know that Wolf's Message is worth listening to, because his soul knew that we are all souls and got that through to the surface just before he passed. When he was struck by lightning, his parents, when they got news, his dad and his stepmom, Mike and Beth, didn't know what to do while they were waiting for the police to release his body to them. So they went to the tree where he was struck by lightning. And they had stopped at a florist and bought two red roses and placed them at the base of the tree as a memento, as a memory, a testament to their son. Then they were finally let in his apartment the next day. Now Mike had been there in the apartment two days earlier and knew that this poem had not been on the wall at the time. So this poem written by and a drawing drawn by the son who was struck by lightning was done the day before he passed. And look what the poem says. Spirit of great healer, awaken within this heart. Peace and tranquility flow like water. The time has come to allow the light of nature to free my soul. Now, as if that's not enough, this poem was tacked to the wall directly across from something very significant. Wolf had a favorite t-shirt. He wore it all the time. But he had cut it apart and tacked it to the wall across from that poem. And there it is. There are some things in this life we can't explain, like the one I'm about to show you now. Mike and Beth had focused on the words in the poem. They focused on the yin-yang symbol he drew in the center of that eye because he used to draw a lot of yin-yang symbols. It wasn't until later they said, oh my gosh, there's something more significant here. Look what he drew on the right. The exact tree with two red roses, at least roses at the base of it. There's only one way to explain that, and you can't explain it within this story. You have to go beyond the story. The soul knows things. Things are planned, and things happen for a reason. So what may seem like the greatest tragedy to Wolf's parents, his dad and his stepmom shown here just before I did a reading for them, is not a tragedy for Wolf. And in fact, he turned out to be a great teacher and continues to teach all of us. Two days before I was set to do a reading for Mike and Beth, knowing nothing about how he passed, he dropped in on me, just like Brenda had later, dropped in on me in my bed at 5.30 in the morning. It's one of those things where I don't say to Ty, don't talk. He knows when he hears me writing on the pad of paper that I keep by my pillow in the dark not to say anything because our bed gets a little crowded sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Wolf, in that unexpected visit with no feedback from anyone, just pure information coming from him, shared 45 different things about himself that I could have validated by Mike and Beth later. I was so excited because these were very unusual things. They were validated later and scored by Dr. Gary Schwartz at the University of Arizona's Laboratory of Human Consciousness. This is a bar chart showing the accuracy of that unexpected visit. I wasn't real happy with this because it was only 73% accurate. I like to be 90, 90% or more, but considering the circumstances, I guess that was pretty good. But what bugged me is how come 13% of those things, and there were some things we couldn't validate like it's very peaceful here. But other things like, I was a loner, my name is actually Mike Jr. All kinds of verifiable things made sense, but 13% of the things did not make sense. How could all these things be right and these things be wrong? Well, over the next couple months after that visit, all of the things that he shared started to come to light, showing that we are all part of one big web, how connected we all are. I'm not gonna get into all of that today. It's all in my book, Wolf's Message. 
But what came out of that, the whole reason that Wolf dropped in on me with his stunning visit was because he had a lot to share. This is one powerful soul to pass that way and to leave a message like that for all of us. And I've taken his message and distilled it down to some very important points that help all of us on our path. It certainly helped Brenda to awaken. And so we call it the awakened way of living. And the first principle is to understand that all of us, that you are a beautiful soul here and now who walks in two worlds at once and you can learn to access that other world that is right here as Brenda taught us. There's no far off heaven. Heaven is a state of awareness, of pure peace and joy. And the more you come to know that you're a beautiful soul, heaven becomes your daily state of being. So your beautiful soul who walks in both Worlds can be depicted this way. Down here on the bottom, the yin-yang symbol being so familiar to Wolf depicts our world of duality, constantly trying to find that nice balance between other people who don't think like we do, who don't act like we do. So down at our level, we experience the ups and the downs. But when that gets to be too much, thank goodness we know there is another world. And in our consciousness, we can rise above it and become the witness from the soul level where our team in spirit has the big picture all the time. Wolf's main goal was that peace and tranquility flow like water. Isn't that what all of us want? Isn't it? So he left us keys to how to achieve that. And one of those is realizing who you are. And I hope you're beginning to remember who you are. An excitation within the field of consciousness from which all arises, imbued with intelligence, creativity, beauty, completely connected to each other, and where there is no separation what you have is love. So realize who you are to find peace, tranquility, and freedom. Rise above the duality and observe. We can do that any time in an instant when this life gets to be too much, too difficult. Pause. Shift your focus. Look down on yourself like your guides are doing now and see it from that higher perspective. With that higher perspective, drop back down into the story and choose differently from a place of love. So remember, you're not either a soul or a human being. You are both at once. But when you get locked into the story, it can overtake you quite easily, can't, can't it? We believe we are the story. The Suzanne story, the John story, state your name. That's just one aspect of who you are. When you get wrapped up in it, you can have some pretty big swings because that's how stories go. This one on the left says, why? This life makes no sense. But when you realize there's another aspect and you can be the witness, that's why we talk about getting centered because that's where we find peace. So more advice from Wolf, balance your head with your heart. He says that we as humans are out of balance. As a whole, we are, because most of us have forgotten. And that's why I advised you at the beginning, don't listen to this story with your head. We cannot understand the mystery. It is impossible to put it into words. All we can do is tell stories until you have that personal experience of being the light and understanding. So in the meantime, the ego will continue to tell your story and it loves the stories and it loves to tell its story to other people. And as long as you're telling that story and believing it, you're not gonna hear the guidance. So to find peace and tranquility, you have to learn this, to listen, to get silent. Did you ever notice the letters? They're the same. Pretty cool, huh? So let me just show you that those across the veil are always trying to teach us if we will listen. And if you ask, they'll answer. I want to share with you a young man I brought through in a reading 
for his mom. This is Alex. I'll share you Alex's story, but it's very true at this level. Alex came through, and I had forgotten I had given a reading to his mother a year ago, and he started to show me how he passed. He took his own life, and his, his mom said, yes, yes, you gave me that last year. And I said, oh, I forgot I did a reading. Your son is saying, we don't need to go into all that now, Mom. And she said, that's exactly what I said on the way here. No, it wasn't in person. It was by phone. She said, I said to him, we don't need to get into that. I just want to know how you're doing. Well, Alex showed me, because he knows I like evidence, I said, he's showing me a little fob. This is on a keychain, a little round thing that pertains to him. It's a symbol that you would recognize as him. And he says, you carry it with you always. And he says, I do talk to you in the car, Mom. She got all excited. She sent me this picture later. There's the fob on a keychain on her purse, and she asked before the reading, do you, talk, do you hear me when I talk to you in the car? He gave a direct answer to her question. He also said, tell my mom there's something lifted about her appearance, and I like her blonde hair. And she said, I changed my hair since he passed, and I got a facelift. <laughs> Because they know, our loved ones know what we're doing here. So his mom said, ask him what he's doing on the other side. Now, any answer I give to that is we can't prove it. But it's the evidence that comes before it that allows us to trust what we're hearing. So I said, okay, Alex, what are you doing over there? And he goes like this. Oh, which cracked me up. We don't think about people doing that across the veil. And I said to his mom, what I'm sensing from your son is that he was very scattered when he was here. His mind was always going, he was never still. But that he's practicing being still across the veil and ooh, this is cool, he's giving me some teaching now, which I hope you all will, will hear. He said, mom, the reason I'm doing it is because our worlds are right next to each other, like two aquariums with just glass separating them. And if the water on either, in either aquarium is rippled, we can't sense each other. That's why people who are in deep grief, people who have a lot of emotional gunk they need to clear out, can't sense loved ones who have passed. But I thought it was very interesting that he showed it goes the same way from the other side. So he was practicing learning to connect with his mom. By the way, I've been asked to be a, a voice this weekend for my favorite organization for parents who have lost children across the veil. Of course, they're never lost. Their physical presence across the veil now is helping parents heal. So if any of you know anybody who has a child who has crossed, please look into this organization because they allow open discussions of the afterlife, which allows their members to find the joy, to move from hope to knowing their kids are still here. Like this other son that I brought through, I said to his mom, your son is showing me something I've never seen before. He's drawing a rainbow from his heart to yours. And he says, clear as day, the connection is good, mom. And she said, oh, I'm so glad to hear that because I've been trying to connect with him myself in meditation and I've been imagining a rainbow from my heart to his and I swear I hear him more clearly when I do that. Is that awesome? Talk about validation that they hear us. So if you haven't figured it out by now, another key to peace and tranquility freedom from the ego, spend some time with your highest self. This is the way we get to know who we really are beyond the story. And the more you do that, the more your innate qualities as a soul come to the surface. These are some of them. If you don't feel joy, love, peace, and these other in your life on a regular basis, Please get to know your soul again. Reconnect, realign, sit in the silence with intention and get to remember who you are. And remember, because you're a soul, anything is possible. I know we have some wonderful speakers here like Dr. Eben Alexander is gonna show you how unfortunately the brain acts as a filter of consciousness, blocking out the vibrations that are around us all the time. And that's why most people can't connect across the veil. Somehow my filter was just knocked wide open. And when I say wide open, 
I'm about to share with you some stories. I believe I've shared some of this at a past IANS conference, so if you know this story, just listen again and enjoy the beautiful lessons that come from it. But it really caused me to get outside of the box that I was in. I need to remind you my background. Of course, it's just a story, right? But this was me as the chairman's aide. Look at the guy, he's six foot five, 215 pounds, and I had to carry his briefcase. <laughs> Man. But I, it's taken me a while to come to know this greater reality is real and that it is not limited to this physical reality. This has been a big learning point for me. It was hard enough for this Navy officer to start talking about spirit guides and angels without lowering my voice. So imagine, here I am sitting in meditation one day just talking to my guides who I know are very real, when suddenly a very powerful presence drops in on me. Really powerful, very masculine, and he looked a lot like this. He looked like Moses, but I knew it wasn't Moses. He had a long white beard, very strong and kind of stern feeling. And he showed me he had a flying horse. I said, who are you? This is ridiculous but I could tell this was an actual presence. And he said, Odin. And I thought, Odin, Odin, I've heard that name. I'm not sure I know who Odin is. And I'm writing down now, Odin, flying horse. And as I'm writing, I went, ow, because I got this piercing pain in my side, a physical symptom. Much like when I do readings, I get the physical symptoms of how people passed every reading. It's just recreating a frequency to get a point across. So I write down piercing pain in the side. I write down what else he said. Odin comes to teach you the secrets of the runes. And I was like, runes, runes, those are those stones you use as divination tools. I remember that because Wolf drew runes all over everything. So there's something about runes, okay? And Odin says there is much wisdom in the runes. And he went on to give me a lot of guidance and teaching. All the while I'm thinking, am I making this up? Which is a very human reaction. But I know I'll be able to validate things. So what do you think is the very first thing I did when I came out of meditation? That's it. <laughs> Googled Odin. So I go online and I'm reading and I thought, oh no. Odin is a major god in Germanic mythology. In fact, he's the all-father of the Norse gods. Now the Navy officer is saying, this doesn't make sense. How could I have been talking to a mythological figure? But I start digging a little deeper, and look what he looks like. And look who's with him, a couple of wolves. And there's this epic poem written about Odin, and the more I read it, the more surprised I become. For nine long nights he hung from this tree, he has the wolves there beside him. He was pierced in the side by a spear. Ow. Kind of hard to explain away physical symptoms. And then how do you explain away the fact that Odin is the mythological figure credited with discovering runes. Okay, I go a little further and find out that Odin, the mythological figure, had a flying horse named Sleipner. Okay, need I remind you again of my background? I'm talking to mythological figures now. <laughs> but it's the evidence that allowed me to go back into meditation, knowing that if you've communicated with some aspect of consciousness once, you can do it again. So this time I sat and I got into an expanded state of awareness and I said, Odin, I have questions. Will you please come back? And I felt that presence again. Just like when a loved one who has passed steps into one's energy field, you can feel it. And there was no mistaking this guy's power. So once I felt him, I sent him gratitude from my heart to thank him for showing up, and I had some questions. I said, my number one question, are you real? And he replied, as real as you are, but not human. And I said, 
but you are a myth. And without missing a beat, Odin replied, you are a myth. <laughs> Nothing is real. This is such huge food for thought, isn't it? We call myths non untrue stories. We are, when we use our left brain, we talk about facts and myths. But what if they're all stories that bubble up from the field of energy that we call consciousness? So I got to studying a little bit about mythology, and it's pretty, pretty cool. We're all heroes. We all come here to have adventures. We enter into this life for some call to adventure. What's calling you? What adventures have you been on? And we go through life and we face trials, but happily we have helpers. And like all stories that go up, they have an abyss. And some have even deeper abysses. But as a result of that, all of us, because all stories are like this, go through some kind of transformation. Isn't that why you're here? And then we realize we really are at one with all that is, called the at one -ment. You might have heard it pronounced atonement. And ultimately, we turn back. And as we cross the veil, our team, who knows us so well, greets us lovingly and says, and what have you learned from your adventure? What have you brought back with you? Hopefully, a little more love, a little more beauty, because that's why we bubble up. That's why we create. Someone recently sent me this beautiful quote from Joseph Campbell. Myth is the secret opening through which the inexhaustible energies of the cosmos pour into human cultural manifestation. So my question was, what is real? And this is a direct quote from an aspect of consciousness that called itself Odin. Odin said, you must stop differentiating between real and unreal. Do you not know now that angels and archetypes are real? All archetypes are groupings of consciousness at different levels of vibration. Anything that you can create in consciousness is real and can convey truth, Messages, information, learning, healing, and growth. That's the whole point. All is not as it seems. You are just another part of me. And he wasn't just talking to me. He's talking to all of us who are all just a part of the one mind, the one I, the I am. Everything else is story. And there's nothing wrong with stories. They bubble up constantly for a reason, to allow us a vehicle to experience life in all of its many manifestations. The stories are awesome and they're interesting. They're not always fun, but they always provide opportunities for growth, don't they? So the big question becomes, does the story that your soul is living out serve you? More importantly, does it serve the greater good? Follow your passion. And remember, as Buckminster Fuller said, humans learn by trial and error. So we make mistakes all the time. So don't do that again. That's how we learn. So another key in line with this to finding that peace and tranquility that Wolf came back to teach us about is this one, make the highest choices. And it's always going to be one that's aligned with love. It's pretty simple. Somehow it gets lost in the execution for people who don't remember who we are. But when you start to know I am the light, that choice is so easy. I choose love. I choose peace. So there I was. I don't know, six months later, maybe even a year, sat in meditation again, put on my meditation uniform. No, that's the only photo I have of me in meditation. <laughs> and I hadn't thought about Odin in a long time. 
and suddenly, there he is. My gosh, I'd know this feeling anywhere. This is Odin. He started out with a question for me, kind of stunned me. He said, like a test, who was my son? And I replied, I know that answer. I Googled you. <laughs> Your son was Thor. And I thought at the time it was kind of unusual because there's that lightning bolt connection that seems to come up in my life. It's how my stepdaughter was killed. It's how Wolf was killed. And here's this mythological figure conversing with me, and his son was a god of lightning bolts. So I answered that question correctly, and then Odin said, and who was your Susan's dog? And I had to think for a minute, and suddenly in my mind's eye flashes the very last photo I have of Susan, lying with her brand new puppy she got just before she was struck and killed by lightning. And she named that dog Thor. And it took a mythological figure to remind me of something that we had never connected. But you see, when that mythological figure arises from the same sea of consciousness as all of us, it's one big web. And source, spirit, will get important messages through to you in whatever way works. And I ran to Ty and I said, Ty, Odin just visited me. I can imagine, Ty's a retired Navy destroyer captain, okay? <laughs> and here's his wife saying, you know, that, that mythological god, he's back again. <laughs> and he reminded me Susan's dog was named Thor, the god of lightning bolts. And he's looking at me, understanding the significance of that. And I said, what was Susan's other dog's name? And we couldn't remember, so I asked, and then it popped right into my head, Loki. Loki was her other dog's name. And Loki is a son of Odin. And it was in putting together this presentation, making up these slides, and looking into mythology, that somehow I got to thinking Susan had three dogs, and the other one was Athena. And I looked it up, and in Greek mythology, Athena was trusted by Zeus to wield the thunderbolt. So how do you have a young woman who's struck by lightning, all three of her dog's names have a connection to that. It happens for the same reason that a young man who's going to be struck by lightning leaves a poem about that very thing. Because number two in the awakened way, the principle is you are part of one big web connecting all that is. You can't be separate from this source from which you acting out your story arise. You're an expression of that light. So let me show you a little bit of the web. This is my now dear friend Colleen and her son Austin who crossed to the other side a couple years ago. Did a wonderful reading for them and a year later on the date that he passed I agreed to do a second reading for them just to celebrate the fact that what we know is true, that our loved ones are still right here, still part of our lives and know what's going on in our lives. And very briefly of the many things he shared, he started right off, I said, Austin's right here, he's showing me, I know he was a medical doctor, but he's showing me, Colleen, that you still have his medical coat, it's hanging on a hanger in his room on the closet. He shows me his name embroidered on it. The stethoscope is hanging around the neck and he says, you talk to it every day. There it is, exactly as he showed it to me. He knows his mom goes in and talks to that because she's talking to him and he's right here, as Brenda said, because there's only here. And I said, and now Austin's showing me you writing a little card to somebody. It's a thank you card and he shows me the front of it and has a single feather on it. She sent me a photo of it. She was writing it that morning to thank the woman who had recently cared for his cat. Do you see how our loved ones know what's going on in our lives? Because it's one big web. And they're not over there, they're right here, as Brenda showed me. And then he flashed in my mind's eye this red pickup truck, and I said, Austin, I know they have that truck. They drove it to my, to my RV that time for the first reading. And he said, yeah, but the oil needs changed. <laughs> 
And I said, oh, that's really cheesy. You know, anybody, you could need the oil changed at any time. But I passed along his message, and his dad said, Austin's the one that always used to change the oil in that truck, and the change oil light came on this morning. <laughs> now that's evidence. But why I bring up Austin right now to show you the web is because in the middle of that reading, I was stunned. My Susan dropped in. And she says, I'm here too, Suzanne. I said, Colleen, Susan's here. I don't hear from her that often, but she's here in the middle of your reading. And she said, that's because I asked her to come. Colleen is a former military. She knew Susan was in the military. She thought she could help the connection a little bit. Do you see how intelligent all of us acting out our stories are? It doesn't matter if we're across the veil. Susan confirms it's one big web. We're all connected, whether here or here. There's only here. I love this lightning bolt, actually. It symbolizes to me how I see the light, one big light that bursts forth and bifurcates into different aspects of different stories. And I think we humans are way down here at the tip, but along the way we meet our guides and we meet the masters and we meet other realities until it all merges once again into one light. And the final principle of this way of living by the light is you find your way home with a capital H through the heart, through the heart. That's the bridge to the soul. Wolf knew this so well, who we really are. This is a quote from my book, Wolf's Message, a direct quote from Wolf to me in the middle of the night. When you focus on your roles, your stories, as human beings, you see yourselves as individual entities, like separate pieces of a puzzle. When you see with the eyes of the soul, you see the whole picture. There is only one spirit with a capital S, but it takes many forms. The center of each of you is the heart, but together you form the one heart of God. As above, so below. This understanding is what is most needed at this time so that all of you may find freedom. Remember that word? You find your way home through the heart. So remember Brenda, I'm free, I'm free, and she's the one that said, they really are people suits, Suzanne. So it's one day after Brenda passed, she comes to me. Two days later, Lynette is standing in Brenda's kitchen because she was there when she passed and she was still at Brenda's house. She was the only one in the house and she heard a little funny noise from the dining room. It was Brenda's computer powering itself up. She went in to find it on the dining room table. Nobody else in the house. And this is the normal screenshot on Brenda's computer when it's powered up. But this is what was on the screen when it powered up by itself. <laughs> Who can deny this web? Who can deny that there is a creative, intelligent source bubbling up through all of us I went to Brenda's celebration of life. She was so awesome, she gave code words through me that people at the Hart House in Sedona had written on little pieces of paper and put in a little basket that Lynette took home. Nobody knew what was on each other's piece of paper. And I'm sitting at her celebration of life somewhere over the rainbow plays and Brenda's sitting right beside me because she's not gonna miss her celebration of life. And she's saying, rainbow, that's Lynette's code word, and I'm writing it down, and I'm writing down other things she's saying, and comments she's making about all the nice things people are saying about her. And just as they were showing pictures of the Heart House gathering that I showed you earlier, where those members of the Souls Awakening group she founded gathered, just as they were showing those pictures, she holds up in my mind's eye a popsicle. Everything else that she shared was auditory, but not this popsicle, so I wrote it down. Later that night over dinner with some of the Souls Awakening group who were at the celebration, I went over the list. That's when I found out somewhere over the rainbow was indeed, rainbow was Lynette's code word. And I said, I don't know why she held up a popsicle right during the pictures of the heart, the heart house. And this woman to my right went, ah! 
which is like the best sound a medium can ever hear, okay? <laughs> her name is Lisa Wilcoxon. Her code word was popsicle. And she was late to the celebration of life because she got lost and she walked in right when the pictures of the Hart House were on the screen. That was Brenda's way of saying, you're late. <laughs> which I love. So here's a little more teaching from Brenda. So when you say all souls are right here, well, see, this is the thing. Here and there are one. I'm with you. I'm just going back and forth in my mind, in consciousness. So really, your love doesn't have to cross this arbitrary veil. It's all just love. And this has been my message all along. Once I felt that connection from connecting across the veil, it's all about love. So like Brenda, I get a little Pollyanna-ish now and then. And I remember putting on Facebook this post one day, we are here to learn to love each other. And one woman replied, what kind of bubble are you living in? <laughs> And I thought that was so appropriate with, because of this bubble analogy that I've been sharing. <laughs> Do you remember I said this is a cheesy little analogy? What a happy thought, the happy thought bubbles. Well, now I'm going to tell you why I shared that exact analogy. And I'm going to do it with the help of this beautiful young woman, Shana. Shana passed at 15 years old. We've heard of sudden infant death syndrome, but have you ever heard of sudden adolescent death syndrome. Can you imagine having a beautiful 15-year-old daughter and she just doesn't wake up? Well, happily, I brought her through very evidentially in a reading for her parents that showed she's right here. And I say almost everything in a reading, but in that particular reading, I left out one detail because it was this little thing that looked like a Christmas ball, but I wasn't sure what it was and I didn't get a feeling that went with it. It just kind of disappeared like that, so I didn't bring it up. But that bothered Shana, obviously, because she dropped in on me several times later saying, tell them about that, tell them about that. And I didn't, so finally, I'm sitting on my lanai writing my book still right here and Shana drops in on me and she says, call my parents. Well, I texted, I said, Shana's here and she's showing me this image of her. She's dressed like a cat and she has her claws up like this going meow, meow and she's laughing hysterically and now she's drawing little whiskers on her face. What's up with this? Minute later, my phone dings, it's her mom replying. She said, we are in tears and she included this photo. So then she says, ask my mom about her question. So now I get her mom on the phone. You have a question for your daughter? She says, no. So I check with Shana. Yeah, she says, you have a question for her. And she said, well, wait, well, wait, yes. Yesterday in meditation, I thought I sensed Shana's presence and I said, are you really here right now? So I check with Shana, and I know that I could just say yes, but they know there's nothing like evidence. And Shana said, not only was I there, but I know my mom was using mala beads in her meditation. Once again, her mom's crying, because that day, for the first time in two years, she'd gotten her mala beads down from the shelf and her book on mala beads and was using them in meditation. So that, yes, I was there with you, Mom, can absolutely be trusted. And it was Shana who gave me the idea of using the happy thought bubble analogy, because she wants me to show all of you right now this thing that she showed me in meditation is hanging in her parents' kitchen. And you know what it's called? A happy thought bubble. <laughs> it was given as a gift to her parents after she passed from Shana's volleyball team so that they would have happy thoughts when they think of her. But it's not just happy memories, it's happy knowing she is right here. And she wants you to know that, and that's what we all want you to know and to remember who you are. So enable, in, in order to help you remember that, I'm going to use a prop because I have one final story to share with you. So, <laughs> I 
got my boa hair and it's all tangled up. Now we're going to have feathers all over the stage. So you remember Brenda at the beginning comes through with this story about our magnificence, right? That we're just going to cross through the veil and step into our full magnificence. Well, I did a reading not too long ago with a mom who ha whose daughter passed, and I knew her daughter had passed at age nine. And this mother was in such deep grief that she just wanted to join her daughter. And her daughter had only passed two months earlier, but I said, we're going to try to get her. You need to raise your vibration so we can connect, because you're part of this connection too. So her mom's name is Annie. Her daughter's name is Kylie. I tuned in, hoping beyond hope that we'd have a good connection, because I know how healing that can be. And I tuned in, and all of a sudden, I started bouncing with this energy. And I said, oh, your daughter is so bubbly. That's a little messed up. So bubbly. And I said, and she's just, my goodness, she feels precocious. She's just so full of herself and very, very wise. And I don't know why this slide is messed up, but oh, she was coming through like this, this little bossy nine-year-old, just adorable, actually. And I said, and she's like the teacher's pet, and she always strives to do her best in school. And her mom said, this is my daughter to a T. I was thrilled because the best thing we can do is capture somebody's essence in a reading. And I felt her so strongly. And I said, she's showing me that her schoolmates just sang a song to her. I believe it's that You Are My Sunshine song. And her mom said, I don't know anything about that. But a week later, she verified four days before the reading, her classmates had sung You Are My Sunshine to her. I said, your daughter's showing me you have a dog. She loves this dog. But she's saying, my dog has bad breath. Now, how's that for bizarre evidence? Well, the night before the reading, her mom and dad had been talking about how bad the dog's breath is. That's one of those things where you know they're right here. They're listening to our conversations. I said, she's showing me that you put a teddy bear in the coffin with her, and there's a pin in that teddy bear. Yes, indeed. See the pin in its ear? Put in the coffin with her, and of course she knows that. And then she said, tell my mom I'm safe. That's a strange thing to say. Of course they're safe across the veil. Do you know her mom had asked silently, are you safe, Kylie? A direct answer. She said, I'm going to tickle your hair, mom. Now that got my attention. Because every time since Brenda passes that she drops in on me, I feel a tickle in my hair. And so do our friends. A tickle in the hair. Isn't that interesting? I said, Kylie says she's going to do the same thing to you that she does with my friend to let you know she's around. And just as the reading was ended, and I don't say this very often, I said, send me her picture, because I just don't see them. Will you send me Kylie's picture? And her mom said, yeah. And her mom told me later she had several to choose from. But something made her choose. This one. With the boa. Now I looked at that picture and I was stunned. This is another picture that her mom could have chosen. And I was honest and open with her. I said, there is some kind of disability with your daughter. She said, yes, I cared for her 24-7, and that's why it was so hard when I lost her. And I said, but she showed me she was teacher's pet and tried so hard in school, and she said she did, and she always excelled. And she was bossy, and she was precocious, but she didn't show me any disability. You know why? Because I was tuning into her soul. I was tuning into her magnificence. We got her story perfectly, so mom recognized her. But what a message for all of us. She left that people suit behind. And mom, I'm here and I'm safe and I know about the dog's bad breath. <laughs> and we're all right here. So I'll end this the way we began this. Brenda says, most people are walking wounded. You can see the scars from up here. They're like little knife wounds all over the auras. They're battle scars. 
but that light never goes out. Just like you always say, Suzanne, we really are the light. But what followed was the scars get this extra glow around them, the ones we heal by working on them. They look like little glow worms. Is that a beautiful image? I truly hope that this helps you to clear out whatever wounds you're carrying, because we all have them, to realize that you're the one that turns up the light from inside, to not rely on anyone else to do that for you, to walk around and see the light inside of everybody. When you shine your light, it can't help but shine back at you. So please do me a favor and leave here and just shine all over everyone and our time here will have been worth it. I end with this direct quote from Wolf, one of the most powerful souls I've met across the veil. He speaks to all of us as he says, now you see what it means to be free, no longer encumbered as the one who still slumbered, but awakened to who and what you are. We are the light. Thank you so much.